Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3 Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. A big story coming out of Lebanon where Hezbollah sources have told Al Jazeera that they fired a mix of 200 rockets and explosive drones from southern Lebanon at several Israeli military positions across the border. Now, it's the second day that rockets have been launched. Multiple fires have broken out. Now, Israel says it's striking targets in southern Lebanon. This latest escalation follows a killing of a senior Hezbollah commander in southern Lebanon on Wednesday. Now, a vehicle was targeted in the Huch area in the city of Tyre. The Israeli Defense Minister Yov Galan says the attack proved that Israel could hit Hezbollah every day. Nearly nine months of rockets, drones, wildfires, and the slow trickle of names killed in the daily cross-border fire. Today, it is Abu Ali Nasir, Hezbollah acknowledging his death by 4 p.m. Jerusalem time. Images from the scene show what is believed to be Nasir killed this morning by purported airstrike in the coastal city of Tyre in southern Lebanon, some 12 miles away from the Israeli border. As of this morning, Nasir was believed to still lead Hezbollah's Aziz unit, one of the big three regional divisions of organized ground forces operating in southern Lebanon. Led by men with prior combat and leadership experience, primarily in the Syrian civil war. Nasir's reported death follows the killing of Talib Abdullah, another senior regional commander in Lebanon south, hit by a purported Israeli airstrike last month. It's not clear how Hezbollah has replaced these field commanders on the ground, but it's believed their deputies have long been trained to take over. Hezbollah fully aware Israeli airstrikes continue to target their leadership in the field. We are striking Hezbollah very hard every day, and we will also reach a state of full readiness to take any action required in Lebanon or to reach an arrangement from a position of strength. We prefer an arrangement, but if reality forces us, we will know how to fight. Meanwhile, U.S. Special Envoy to Lebanon Amos Hotstein in Paris today, meeting with his French counterpart, the two men tasked by their nations in stopping all-out war. Their meeting comes as Israeli officials in recent weeks have openly discussed shifting their focus from Hamas in Gaza to Hezbollah in Lebanon. As expected, Hezbollah launched a massive series of rocket and drone attacks on northern Israel on Thursday, retaliating for Wednesday's elimination of one of its senior commanders in an Israeli airstrike near the southern Lebanese city of Tyre. The IDF said Hezbollah fired some 200 rockets and launched 20 explosive-laden drones at Israel. The response to the assassination of Abu Nami began last night and was swift. And today, the series of reactions continues in sequence until this hour and will continue. They were aimed at new places that Israel never imagined would be hit. The IDF said a reservist officer, 38-year-old Major Itai Galia, was killed by rocket impact. Emergency services said it treated two people who were lightly hurt by falling while running to shelters. 
A number of fires were sparked as a result of some of the rocket and drone interceptions, including one in Amalan Ako near Haifa. The IDF said it responded with multiple waves of airstrikes in southern Lebanon, with locals in Beirut reporting hearing sonic booms. This latest escalation comes as Hezbollah held a funeral for its slain senior commander, Mohammed Nasser. Nasser commanded the Aziz unit, one of Hezbollah's three regional units in southern Lebanon, responsible for much of the attacks against Israel in recent months. Hezbollah pundits in Lebanon accuse Israel of trying to lure the Iranian-backed group to retaliate forcefully, which will enable Israel to launch a wider war. And in Israel, too, the public seems convinced that an all-out war with Hezbollah is imminent. Iran itself represents an even greater danger to Israel. Tuesday, the commander of Iran's aerospace force declared his unit soldiers are craving to launch another aerial assault on Israel. The first happened on April 13th, when Iran launched close to 350 projectiles against the Jewish state. Israel and an allied force, including the U.S., France, the U.K. and Jordan, shot down nearly 99 percent of those weapons. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17:1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Elam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Psalm 917, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Tonight, a massive wildfire in Northern California burning out of control amid triple digit temperatures. The Thompson fire spreading across more than 3,500 acres with zero containment. As tens of thousands scramble to safety ahead of the July 4th holiday, forced to evacuate with the fire bearing down on residential neighborhoods outside the city of Oroville. I'm a little bit worried that, you know, we might not have a place to go back to. Several homes and structures destroyed as firefighters work round the clock to battle the fast moving blaze. Flames burning on either side of the Oroville Dam spillway. Crews are using Lake Oroville here to try to fight this fire. You can see multiple helicopters right now are coming to the lake, picking up water to attack this fire from the air. The inferno, one of several burning across the West with intense heat and heavy winds, creating conditions ripe for fire. What's the biggest challenge right now? I would say the biggest challenge is obviously the conditions, uh, the high temperatures, those low humidities, and uh, without a doubt, the wind is going to be the biggest concern. This is 120 million people are facing heat alerts as a dangerous heat wave scorches large swaths of the country. In Phoenix, where temperatures hit 113, the heat wave turning deadly. A 10-year-old boy died after being airlift from a trail where authorities say he was hiking with family. So far this year, 13 people have died from heat-related incidents in Maricopa County, with another 162 still under investigation. Back in California, the relentless conditions just getting started, with no relief expected through the holiday weekend, leaving the region on edge. Barrel hit in the middle of the night and left nearly everyone on Union Island homeless. This is what's left of the tiny island, just nine square kilometers large, part of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Residents did what they could to survive as homes were torn apart and windows broke around them. They said the pressure was so intense they could feel it in their ears. Hardly anything's been left standing. 90% of the houses have been severely damaged or destroyed. There's devastation in Grenada, too. Barrel made landfall Monday as a Category 4 hurricane. Thousands of people are without power and communication systems are down. It is almost Amagidion like, almost total damage or destruction of all buildings. Complete devastation and destruction of agriculture. Complete and total destruction of the natural environment.
At one point, Beryl reached Category 5 status, with winds of at least 250 kilometers per hour. It's the first time a storm this powerful has hit so early in the season. Meteorologists say it's due to record-breaking heat in the North Atlantic, and scientists say that's all due to global warming. They're warning the season is on track to be much worse than usual. We begin with Hurricane Beryl, the strongest storm to hit parts of the Caribbean in decades. The system brought punishing winds and storm surge to Jamaica as it passed the island as a Category 4. Earlier in Grenada, multiple people were killed, and on some islands, nearly every home was damaged or destroyed. Hurricane Beryl is now a Category 3 storm turning towards Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. As the sun comes up, we're getting a better idea of the extent of the damage here. Scenes like this one behind me, large trees toppled, plenty of power outages as we were driving in. It's just one example of the homes, the businesses, the utilities all being impacted by the strongest parts of this storm, adding Jamaica to a growing list of Caribbean islands cleaning up today. Hurricane Barrel's fierce winds, powerful waves, and torrential rain pummeled Jamaica Wednesday. It's the latest Caribbean country to face widespread destruction from the storm. Barrel toppled power lines, snapped trees, and flooded roads after the prime minister called for a national curfew. Hurricane Barrel is far from over. It's hitting the Cayman Islands today. People there have been boarding up windows and filling sandbags to protect their homes. And in eastern Mexico, preparations are also underway in resort areas including Cancun and Tulum where residents, business owners, and tourists are bracing for Beryl's expected landfall there tomorrow. There are two key prophecies concerning Jesus' signs of his coming and the end of the age that are crucial to discerning that we are living in the last days. The first prophecy is found in Matthew 24, 8. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. This is how end time signs such as wars, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes will occur. They will become more frequent and more intense as we get closer to Jesus' return. The second prophecy is in Luke 21, 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Notice Jesus said when these things begin to happen. Jesus was saying that when you see a convergence of Bible prophecy, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. We are witnessing not only the convergence of Bible prophecy around the world, we are experiencing the frequency and intensity of these prophetic events as well. Naimat Alizada is struggling to cope. Five days ago, floods swept through the Abdana village here in the Bamiyan province of Afghanistan, killing eight members of his family. He says it was the first such severe flooding they had seen. There was complete chaos. Children were crying and women screaming with fear. The water was about 10 meters high. I tried to pull out some of those stuck, but couldn't, and the floods took them. Most houses and shops in the remote village were destroyed, while the raging waters swept away cars and mechanical equipment. This school was damaged, and its container with all school supplies was washed away. The first thing we need is shelter. We need clean drinking water, then financial support, because we have lost whatever we have worked for and earned all of our lives. In Nepal, heavy rains triggered landslides, killing at least nine people on Saturday. Landslides, floods and lightning have killed more than 35 people across the Himalayan kingdom in the last two weeks. Across the border, the Indian capital, New Delhi, had more than 250 times its usual rainfall on Friday, causing disruptions. Sri Lanka, meanwhile, is expecting more rains after a short break from monsoon showers that caused upheaval around the country. Extreme weather events are becoming increasingly common, and this part of the world is no different. This shop owner in southern China's Hunan province is busy cleaning up debris on Wednesday after heavy rainfall and flooding devastated her stationery store. She says she didn't receive any notice to move her goods and ask, how can a family survive in this situation? <laughs> heavy rainfall pounded parts of Hunan earlier this week, causing the water level of a local river to reach its highest level in 70 years. Local authorities have activated the maximum emergency response level. This restaurant owner said she had to flee before it became impossible to get herself out. Now, with her business flooded, she says she is heartbroken 
and doesn't know how she will provide for her children. Last week, President Xi Jinping urged authorities to put in all-out efforts to protect lives as floods and natural disasters increased. China has provided more than $316.4 million in funds to help with rescue efforts and emergency supplies. As deadly floods and landslides caused by almost two weeks of torrential rain ravaged several parts of the country. In Changsha, the capital of Hunan, the Xiang and Laoda rivers are expected to hit peak dangerous levels Thursday morning, state media reported. More than a million people have been affected by flooding in Bangladesh. Authorities have warned of dangerous flood levels in 13 districts in the Sirhad division in the northeast. Tens of thousands have been isolated by floodwaters. Thousands more have been evacuated to temporary shelters after continuous rain for nearly a month. Village after village, we came through this boat have been inundated. The government said about 700,000 people are affected this time. This is the second round of flood. There was flood in the beginning of June where two million people were affected. So this flood is very devastating. This is the second worst flood since last two years. In 2022, there was another major flood. And it's not just the northeastern part of the country. Even the southeast is experiencing heavy rain with landslide. The Rohingya refugee camp has been badly affected. At least two people died, including a kid, uh, on Wednesday morning. And just about two weeks before, there was another landslide where about 10 people died in the Rohingya camp. And in the other parts of the hill track districts, there's been devastating landslide, damaging many homes. Jesus declares this in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus tells us in verse 37, when our days parallel the days of Noah, he is returning. One of the things that parallel our days with the days of Noah is the unprecedented flooding the world has been experiencing over the last few years. Jesus goes on to tell us in verses 38 and 39 that when he returns, things will be going on as normal, as people will be eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Just as in the days of Noah, when people were caught off guard and the flood came, so also will people of our time be caught off guard when Jesus returns. The Bible indicates that there will be a great apostasy during the end times, as we read in 2 Thessalonians 2.3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition. Falling away is the Greek word apostasia, which means defection from the truth, properly the state, apostasy. Apostasia, from which we get the English word apostasy, refers to a general defection from the true God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. The end times will include a rejection of God's word, a further falling away of an already fallen world. By looking at the news headlines of our world today, there can be no doubt we are living in the final moments before Jesus' return. It's disturbing to see these people with immense power over, like, me just getting to exist, not wanting me to exist. Ohio is considering seven bills limiting LGBTQ plus rights, according to the ACLU. These range from gender affirming care bans, gendered bathroom restrictions and school sports bans. It can be really like terrifying at times. I have swimming medals. Sam Bates, who lives in Columbus, is not only starting high school as a non-binary student, they're also on a swim team. The laws could impact whether they're allowed to compete in a full coverage bathing suit. Queer youth are scared. They have reached out to legislators, they've written to uh, medical practices, to different providers, just letting them know how afraid they are. All right. Sam's father, Nick Bates, understands okay. that fear. All of these things I think will do harm to kids, especially kids that don't have, whose parents are still trying to figure it out and are scared. One of the bills Bates is concerned about is HB8, what critics call the state's don't say gay bill. It would require schools to notify parents before teaching sexuality content, which includes sexual concepts and gender ideology. Ohio legislators backing the measure argue it's about parental rights. State Representative D.J. Swearingen saying in a statement that, quote, many parents in Ohio believe that schools
school should provide notification and transparency on certain materials. Do you think that those bills are actually for parental choice? No, I think those bills are about uh, silencing and trying to hide members of our community. But rather than shield Sam from all of this, Bates has taken them to the state house. My swim coach and my uh, dad both used stories about me when they were testified. The government either needs to have our back or let us parent. They should not be creating more roadblocks for parents to parent. And Nick is not just a dad, he's also a deacon at the Lutheran Church in their town. I'm curious, how has your faith helped you be a better advocate for this community? We are called to accompany and to walk alongside of uh, those who have been pushed down and those who have been marginalized. Colossians 2.8, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. According to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Nick says he's optimistic the world is moving toward a more accepting and safer place for Sam. It's hard sometimes in the day to day to have hope, but that's where I really come back to my faith. Put your feet down. <laughs> Ohio is far from alone. The ACLU says there are more than 500 bills like these still being considered in states across the country. It's fascinating, though, to hear Nick talk about how important his faith is in driving him to advocate, because so often we hear the inspiration for people's support of these bills has to do with religion. So there are a lot of beliefs in this country. Matthew 10, 37 through 39. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus said there would be a falling away from the Christian faith and false teachers would rise up as we read in Matthew 24, 10 and 11. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. The Bible tells us these false prophets will twist God's word, as we read in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, as written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, and which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. The Bible goes on to tell us that these false teachers are Satan's servants, as we read in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, and 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. The last days church will not follow the truth in the Bible. They will find false teachers to tell them their sin is okay. And not just that it is okay, but it is biblical, as we read in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. This is what last days Christianity looks like. It is a Christianity that says there are many paths to heaven. When the Bible clearly says Jesus Christ is the only way, it is a Christianity that approves of homosexuality, fornication. If you are having sex and you are not married, it's not called dating, it's called fornication. And abortion, even though God says these things are sin, it is a Christianity that in its church services look just like the world. Jesus goes on to tell us the last day's church will be such a worldly, Christ-rejecting church that he has been thrown out, as we read in Revelation 3:14 through 22 And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold, refined in the fire, 
that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In these verses of Scripture, Jesus is talking about the last day's lukewarm church, a church that has one foot in the world and one foot in the church. This church is so disgustingly lukewarm that Jesus vomits it out of his mouth. Jesus counsels the last day's church to buy from him gold, which is purity, white garments, which is righteousness, and isab, which is truth. These three things can only come from the purity, righteousness, and truth that Jesus offers through salvation in him. Jesus is now standing outside the door of the last day's Laodicean church, offering salvation to anyone who will listen. This is the grace and mercy of God. He has been kicked out of his own church, and yet still knocks and offers salvation to anyone who hears his voice and opens the door. I implore you today, if you are not saved, or are a lukewarm Christian, to take up Jesus' offer of salvation that can only be received through him and only him. John 14.6 Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 15, 18-20 If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So if you want to know how ruthless and diabolical the progressive left has become, just look at their attacks on people of faith and religious institutions. Mid-Vermont Christian School takes its cues from the Bible, not the Democratic Party, which apparently is a no-no in the socialist land of Bernie, Ben, and Jerry. Last winter, the girls' basketball team was scheduled to play in the championship game against a school that has a six-foot boy who identifies as a girl. Mid-Vermont took a stand and decided to forfeit the game instead of putting its girls at a physical disadvantage, but also not bowing to the whole transgender ideology. And that's when the trouble started. Almost immediately, the Vermont Principals Association banned Mid-Vermont Christian School from participating in sports or co-ed programs throughout the entire state. So let's bring in basketball coach Chris Goodwin and Ryan Tucker also. He's the senior counsel for Alliance Defending Freedom, which is representing the school in its lawsuit against the state. So, so Chris, tell me about the decision to not compete against the school with a guy playing as a girl and the death penalty that the state hit your uh, school with. Sure. I appreciate the fact you said it was the championship game. It was actually the first playoff game of the year. So oh, we had found out. Yeah. We found out midway through the season that there was a male athlete playing on one of the girls' teams in the state. And they weren't on our regular season schedule, but we were seated against them in our first playoff game. Being a religious school, a Christian school, Christian parents, Christian coaches, Christian families, we decided that we were not going to compromise our religious beliefs and we were not going to play that game. So we graciously forfeited that game, allowed the other team to move on in the tournament. And like you said, shortly after that, the state removed us from all athletics for its participation in the state. What else did they do? It wasn't just sports, right? No, it wasn't. Well, no sports at all. So no cross country, no track, no soccer. And they also would not allow other students from other schools participate in any sport that we offered that another public school wouldn't offer. So we have a volleyball program, which a lot of schools in the area do not have. And they were not even allowing public school students play on our volleyball team this year and along with that academic competitions as well math teams science fairs things like that so completely removed it's so despicable so ryan uh what the state of vermont did to this school it's obviously it's egregious uh it is obvious so explain the lawsuit 
Well, first off, Vermont cannot discriminate against a Christian school for simply following its religious beliefs. What the state is trying to do is to purge schools and, and people from the public square because they don't agree with the government on a controversial issue where they're ignoring basic biology, uh, safety, privacy, the importance of free speech and religious freedom. It's vindictive, it's outrageous, and we filed a federal lawsuit. You know, what do you think your chances are given, I mean, it, to me, it's, it's clear cut, but Lord knows what kind of judges you might get. Well, one, one would think, but we, we filed our lawsuit in the district court in Vermont. We asked the court to enjoin the state from enforcing its gender identity policies against mid-Vermont Christian and to let the school back into the sports association. But unfortunately, the district court denied that request. So we are planning to take the matter up with the Court of Appeals here very shortly. It's crazy. So, so Chris, what's the reaction been like from like parents and alumni of the school? How about the kids who are totally being punished and they're caught in the middle of this, but they're being punished? Right. Kids obviously disappointed. We had the opportunity to play in the playoffs and there was, you know, a couple teary eyes, but they all understood. The families understood. The administration understood. And I've really gotten nothing but support, even from public school athletic directors, other coaches. I haven't had one person contact me in any way that was not supportive the support's been great you know but me as a dad i just can't as a dad i'm not going to send my daughter who's a freshman out to play against a six foot three male athlete that would be irresponsible on my part so if the state says that we need to play against our girls need to play against male athletes in order to participate we're just not going to go along with that so that's where we stand right now no, good for you as a dad and a coach. And Ryan, by the way, if Vermont succeeds, they they can put every type of Christian or religious organization out of business unless they don't practice what they preach. I mean, the ramifications are really serious. It's either you pray to progressivism or pray to your God, but you can't do both. So what happens here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Mid Vermont Christian simply believes that boys are boys and girls are girls, and they're punished for that belief. Being transgender is at odds with science and God's design, as we read in Genesis 126 and 27. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Somehow, in some mysterious and wonderful way, the human male and female, in both body and spirit, are the image and likeness of God. Satan hates mankind because we are created in God's image. He is sowing confusion in the minds of our children, and he is busy in these last days devouring those who are not steadfast in the faith, as we read in 1 Peter 5, 8-11. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Christian schools across the state there, uh, across this nation, obviously believe that as well. And so if this were to take hold, not just in Vermont, but elsewhere, this would be, have a very negative impact on religious schools and their ability to, to compete in these state-run associations. Well, I wish you both a lot of luck in this. We'll watch it, and it's really important for common sense and, and the rule of law. So Ryan Tucker from Alliance Defending Freedom, you do a great job. And uh, Coach Chris Goodwin, you may not have been in the championship game, but you're our champions, and I think you would have won it all anyway. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Remember to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Hebrews 13.3 1 Corinthians 12, 26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear 
that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.